Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Recession Proof. The whole purpose of this is to kind of get you guys thinking a little bit differently about the economy and what's happening and ultimately how to play this, right? Because money is a game and we don't necessarily get told the rules of money per se. And so we have to learn this on our own. And in order to obviously win, you kind of know how to know the rules. And when you figure out the rules, you realize that a lot of the things that people tell you or that you hear in the media are not necessarily aligned with how to win. So <clears throat> that's the whole premise of this, um, this presentation today and to give you guys some value. So before we get started, just some quick housekeeping notes. All this content is just for information and educational purposes only. Uh, this is not financial advice. You gotta do your own research and just cause there's different types of people here. So everyone's situation is different. And I can't guarantee you a specific outcome or profit, but I do uh, definitely <clears throat> encourage you to do your own research. And I think there's a lot of opportunity coming forward. So feel free to keep your camera off or on. I'm going to keep mine off now, but at the end, I'll turn it back on if we have a like Q&A. Feel free to do whatever you're comfortable with. And just please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. And then just, you know, please be respectful of other people's ideas and situations. We're all here to learn together. And uh, with that said, let's get going. Okay, so here's a, just a quick overview of what I'm going to cover today. And I'm going to talk about, you know, are we in a recession currently or yet? I'm going to talk about the top five mistakes that people make in a recession. Third, I'll talk about how to prepare defensively for a recession. And then, of course, on the other side of things, how to prepare offensively for a recession. Fifth, we'll talk about creating your own recession-proof plan. And then six, we'll, you know, do a Q&A, discussions, and share some resources with you guys. All right, I'll keep this one brief, but I know there's a couple of people in here that are brand new. So just quickly, my name is Michael Kwan. I'm your financial freedom coach. And my whole mission is to really help you guys play this game of money better, faster, and independently so that you can live your best life and create a positive impact. A little bit about me is I went to school and got an economics degree. I started investing in my 20s. I started a seven-figure IT support company in my 20s and sold it in my 30s. Rolled over some of those that equity into real estate investing. And from there, I did the whole retire early from a traditional nine to five. And then I got a little antsy. And so I started sharing ideas on my blog, Financially Alert, that spawned a podcast, YouTube channel, and started doing financial coaching as people asked me for help. And then I authored The Fire Planner last year and started public speaking in the last year doing random TV guest spots and conferences and events. And as well as I teach people about NFTs and uh, some of you that are in here are in that course as well. So thanks for hanging out with me on that side of things as well. It's always fascinating. All right, so let's dig in. So what is a recession? And you can see here, I put the definition that is most widely known and adopted and you know recession is just a significant widespread prolonged downturn in economic activity and so back in july the nber the national bureau of economics and research they came out and said that we had the second quarter of negative gdp growth so for a lot of people this is considered a technical recession and you'll hear the government saying well we're in a potentially a recession but we don't really know so here's the funny thing. Are we in a recession or are we not, right? And my general feeling is that we are likely already in a recession. And here's why. And here's why it's potentially going to get a lot worse. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I think it's going to get a lot worse. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. Anything can happen. With that said, it behooves us to be prepared and to position ourselves so that we can really act not only defensively, but ultimately offensively, I think, because that's really the easiest place to create wealth. And I'll, I'll share some stories with you as we go forward about how I did that back in like 2000, after 2008, and also earlier in 2001 after 9-11. So, you know, ultimately right now, we find ourselves in an environment where the Fed, which is the central bank for the United States, is increasing interest rates. And the reason why they're doing that, of course, as you all know, is that there's rampant inflation. And so back in June, the 
government published numbers, CPI index, which is a consumer price index of 9.1% year over year. And so what that means is essentially the basket of goods, including like rent and food and, you know, different things like apparel, gasoline, all of those things went up in price by the tune of 9% on average. And so that's a significant chunk of change that people have to come up with additionally in order to buy the same basket of goods. So in order for the Fed to get control of this, they have to start increasing rates. And then that trickles down over into the banks. And then the banks pass that along. And it comes in the form to us as the consumer as higher credit card rates, higher mortgage rates, higher car payments. If you're financing a car or any large purchase, you're going to pay much more for the ability to borrow money. So the reason why this is important for us in terms of a recession is, is putting downward pressure on people so that they don't go out and borrow as much money and buy things. Additionally, corporate guidance has been weakening in the past couple months. If you guys are tapped into the real estate market at all, you're seeing in certain metropolitans, the real estate inventory is really expanding. And what I mean by that is there's more real estate inventory on the market. And that means that homes are sitting out there. And maybe in the last, let's just say like last year, a lot of times you would go out and list a home and it would sell literally within days. And sometimes there would be multiple people trying to buy the same home. So there was this crazy bidding war. And now what we're seeing is homes are actually starting to stay on the market. And we're also seeing prices falling. Where I'm at invested is Las Vegas. And so I'm seeing a lot of the prices now starting to fall. And that's that's exciting to me. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Of course, we also talked in terms of a technical definition, we definitely had the two quarters of negative GDP growth as of July. And we're also seeing you know global pressures from the war in Ukraine. Gas prices have been all over the board. It's come down some recently. And one of the things that you guys might know about is China actually has a very unstable real estate market almost to the degree of a 2008 for us here in the United States, because they've basically borrowed a lot of money and built out developments and then financed based on the equity of these developments that haven't even been completed. And so there's a little bit of a house of cards effect that's going to happen potentially in China. Who knows when that's going to happen, but it could spill over into the US. So all of these are pointing towards not only necessarily being in a session now, but getting much worse going forward. And so we just definitely want to know that's out there. And I do want to just preface this really quickly to say that recession is something that is common in a normal, healthy economy. And it's something that we see in cycles. So, you know, one of the questions that a lot of people have is, you know, how long will the recession last? Well, most recessions will last anywhere from a few months to a few years. And on average, most of them are approximately 17 months. And of course, that's an average. So one of the shortest ones, which you guys will know, was really recently, was when we had COVID, right? And when we had COVID, it was pretty interesting, right? I don't know about you guys, but I thought like we're going to have this huge downturn. And then instead, you know, the Fed pumped a bunch of money into the system. And then all of a sudden, you know, prices went back up in real estate and consumer spending went back up and the recession basically disappeared within like one cycle. So just kind of know that Whatever we potentially think, there's still all these unknown variables that can still make their way into the economy. So we don't necessarily have to time exactly when it's going to happen, but we can see the effects of it. And we want to be able to maneuver ourselves based upon those effects. So I just want to share the top five mistakes that people make in a recession and some that I've made myself definitely early on in my investing career. And the first one is just apathy, right? People don't even necessarily think about a recession or they're like, just ignore it. And they're like, ah, whatever, you know, whatever it will be, will be. The other is waiting too late. And then it makes you become more reactive instead of proactive. And the problem with that is that if you're reacting, then it doesn't give you room to breathe. It doesn't give you the ability to pounce and really get an advantage. And the third thing is if you really wait and you really put your head in the sand, that can lead to panicking, right? If people continue to spend crazy and interest rates go up on their credit cards, all of a sudden they could be in a world of hurt and just spiraling out of control with their personal finances. And then four, 
failing to adapt. And they're all kind of related in some sense, right? In that they just go about their normal day and they don't figure out the patterns that are in front of them. And that's not any fault of theirs, right? A lot of times with personal finances and money, we're not taught these things. So again, it really behooves us to educate ourselves. And then five, overlooking opportunities. There's so many opportunities that come out from a recession. And again, this is why I'm so excited to present this material to you guys. All right. So the first part is how do you prepare defensively for a recession? And when we're playing defense in a recession, here's the things that I typically will share with my coaching clients or I generally talk about. But first, it's really about in this specific environment of high inflation and with the Fed really pushing up interest rates, it's paying down that credit card debt aggressively. If you have any rolling consumer debt that is on high interest, let's just say like, you know, 15%, 18%, even 20%, and it goes up to 25%, I mean, that's really a losing battle. You're really kind of just digging yourself a bigger and bigger hole. So really playing defense is getting focus and paying that down to the best of your ability. And so, you know, how do you do that, right? It's update your budget, determine your have and have nots, and really get mindful with your spending. You know, a lot of times people hear the word budget and they take it, you know, in a kind of negative connotation. But more importantly, it's about being mindful with spending and just making sure that you're getting the most, what we like to call economic utility from your purchases, meaning that you're getting the most value out of it. And so, you know, when it comes to a recession, if you're able to potentially delay large expenditures, maybe like a car or a house, I personally feel that right now is the worst possible time to actually buy. And the reason why is that we're not only in a continued high inflation environment, um, the last numbers that came, I think we came out at 8.5. So even though that's lower and that's good news for the economy, that's still pretty high, right? So we're in high inflation. Right now, we still have a supply shortage, which means higher prices. And so if you were to potentially buy a house now or a car now, you're going to potentially be paying higher interest and higher prices. So I'd much rather see you guys or myself wait for a while, let some of the, the pressure on the economy hit. And then you're going to see all these fire sales. You're going to see potentially prices coming down in real estate. You're going to see prices coming down on the cars. And again, these are the opportunities that we can take advantage of. But really kind of putting yourself in a defensive position is first and foremost, right? Uh, thirdly, you know, really investing in your financial and self-growth education, especially in these times. This is a, a great time to do it. It may not be the most exciting time because, you know, things might not just be doubling overnight. You might not see your portfolio explode, right? And in fact, you might see your portfolio going down. But the truth of the matter is that if you're in it for the long term and for the long run, then you're going to be able to weather the storm. The whole trick with the stock market is that time in the market is much more valuable than trying to time the market. It's very difficult to time the market. And if anyone has ever figured that out, then they would be ridiculously wealthy. And there's probably like a handful of people that can do this. And to be honest, some of those people that did do it, it could be dumb luck. Um, so the point is, is that we don't have to make investing in stocks complicated. One of the things that I talk about in my book, The Fire Planner, is dollar cost averaging into the market. And so some of you may already do that currently with your employer. You have a 401k, or if you're self-employed, you might have some sort of a self-employment program or investment plan that's potentially tax deferred or tax advantage. So definitely keep doing that and potentially even add some more when the markets are down. One of the things that was really interesting, I remember back in 2001 is when I first really started getting involved in investing into stocks and equities. And this was right after 9-11. And basically the entire stock market was crashing upwards of like 40, 50% because it was coming off the dot-com boom as well. And so all these high-flying companies were going out of business. And I had I'd only been around for a little while, but I had some very smart and intelligent mentors in my life that said, hey, you know, I've never seen prices like this before. If you have some excess cash, if you have some excess money, consider investing now. 
And that's why I ended up getting things like Amazon at like $10 a share. I bought eBay, I think at like, you know, 20 bucks a share, whatever it was. The point is that there's opportunities that come out when things go down. But here's the crazy thing is that when you're in a recession, right, the media is going to be constantly chiming in your head. They're going to be saying, hey, you know, the sky is falling. You might want to pull things out. You might want to get super defensive to the point where you're just holding on to everything. And I don't think that's the right answer. It's more about repositioning, being flexible, and then also being ready to strike when you need to. So again, don't sell off your stocks unless you need them for an emergency of some sort. And then if you're able to build up some cash reserves and or create an emergency fund that gives you some of that flexibility for opportunities ahead. All right. One of the biggest mistakes that I made in the past is that I didn't take more action and I didn't do more. I did the initial steps. It served me well. But if I'd literally just gone a little bit above and beyond and rinsed and repeated things that I did do, it could have potentially increased like cash flow and net worth today by five or 10 times more than what it is. And so again, we can learn from these learning experiences, right? And failing forward so that when we have the next recession, which obviously we're headed into, that we can play offense and really hit it home and win. And that's why I'm super excited. So first and foremost, again, we just talked about it on the, on the last screen, but really making a point to stay invested in the stock market. And if you don't want to think about it, you don't want to time it. If you're not an active investor, then be a passive investor. Actually, this is what I suggest is to really be a passive investor by dollar cost averaging into the market consistently over time. Use low cost index funds like VTI or VOO. And VTI, all that is, is it's an index fund that captures the entire stock market. And the best thing about that is it gets you diversified over the entire stock market and gives you the advantage of the markets over time. And so if you look at the stock market over time, you'll see that it just gradually goes up and up and up and up. And if you're able to keep your money in there, what you're really after is the compound interest once it gets to the point of critical mass. And again, the reason why we don't want to time things is because, well, I've tried it before and it was okay, but if I'd left it in the market and just let it basically grow over time, it would have given me the same exact result. So the reason why I think it's better to just leave things passively in the stock market is you set it, you forget it, you let it grow, and then you take your focus and you push it onto cash flowing assets such as real estate or businesses. And so this is where you can really get your hands dirty and you can actually make a significant difference on the outcome based upon your research, based upon your action, based upon you know, potentially the impact that you want to make if it's a business. And so this is where I typically am helping to push people if they want to create what I like to call a fire accelerator. I say, okay, get your stocks in place. But then after that, don't look at it anymore. Just let it go. And slowly over time, it's going to grow and it's going to give you a very nice nest egg. But in the meantime, let's look at things like real estate. And real estate is a huge way that people can build wealth. And especially during this time, as we were going to see prices come down, we haven't seen them come down for quite some time. And we've had an unprecedented bull run in the real estate markets over the last 10 years or so. So things have to come back down. And so that, again, yet another reason why things have to come down in terms of affordability and the people that have existing houses, unfortunately, a lot of them are not going to be able to hold on to those houses if they do the, lose their jobs. So as investors, we have the unique opportunity to come in and potentially put a stop gap to some of this erosion of uh, price in the markets and whatnot. And we can pick up assets that can add cash flow to our own household and then also give us the ability to build long-term wealth as the market cycle back and start going back up. And the reason why I really love real estate is because if you buy it right up front, then it can literally pay you indefinitely for life. But the one thing that a lot of real estate investors won't tell you is that it is a lot of work up front in order to find these so-called gems, but it's very doable and there's lots of people doing it, but it does some, take some time and effort. So 
just keep that in mind as we go forward. You know, the second thing is making sure to start up some sort of a side hustle or a side business to not only learn about yourself and how you want to create impact in this world, but also there's significant tax advantages that you can take advantage of. So even if you don't necessarily think you have a business in mind, I, I think even just providing a little side service, whether it's consulting, whether it's helping maybe your coach, helping them to get a specific goal or whatever it may be, you can create up a little side business. And in the States, at least you can create a Schedule C on your tax return, and you can write off a lot of different expenses like computer equipment, um, going out to eat, travel, different things of that nature. And it's a legal tax advantage that you can keep on your side. So I think everyone deserves to have a side hustle of some sort. The other way that you can play offense is to get a coach or a mentor in order to accelerate your results and your confidence. That was one thing that I wish in hindsight I had done more of. I did in my twenties, take a lot of time reading. I mean, I read voraciously, you know, anything and everything I could get my hands on in terms of books. I went to seminars. I went to different things. I even paid for certain things, but there were certain times where I would get a little scared. Like if it was a bigger price tag or something. And back then it was a lot of money to me. And I was like, well, you know, maybe I can do this myself. And in some ways, you know, I did figure out some of it myself, but the truth of the matter is if I had hired a coach or a mentor specifically for real estate, then I would have been like 10 times along where I am today in my journey. And it would have paid itself many times over. So sometimes we have fears in our head about what we can and what we can't do. But the great thing about a coach or mentor is they're able to see and give you some of that third party perspective on what's possible. And now today I spend money all the time in different coaches and programs and whatnot. And it's allowed me to create a lot of results that I'm able to do quicker than I could do just trying to figure it out on my own. Finally, use other people's money. This is a big one, especially when we're going into a recession and taking offense in that, you know, leverage the bank's money, leverage partners' money, and you don't have to necessarily put up all the money. If you can find a good deal, people will be more than willing to hand you their money. And so part of that, I think, is getting out of the mindset of, you know, it takes money to make money. While that might have a little sliver of truth, the real truth is that you can create value simply by going out, creating relationships, by finding deals in different markets, and by forging a business. And using other people's money to potentially fund it, right? And when you're able to do that, your return on investment goes up significantly. I mean, it goes literally from, you know, let's just say you had to put in, I don't know, $100,000 to buy a house. And instead, you only have to put 10000 right? And then you get the bank to fund the other 90000 All of a sudden, you get the windfall of the asset growing over time, except you're not having to put up your own money. So Definitely think about different ways that you can use OPM. We always use that term, OPM. All right. So creating a recession plan is something that I think is super important. And the reason why you want to plan is that then you don't have to think about things later, right? You've already got a specific structure in place. And then when it comes to it and when things happen, you simply execute. Or you have someone else execute for you and you don't have to think about it. And a lot of people overestimate how much they can accomplish in a year and greatly underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. So I think that's why a lot of people sometimes get jaded, right? A lot of times we come at the end of the year and we're like, all right, let's make a new year's resolution. We're going to do this in the next year. And then it goes past people fall off the track and they don't get the result that they're looking for. And a lot of times people don't take time to look like five years out, 10 years out, and then use the one years as like, you can adjust your strategy, right? You want to create a plan that has a very clear and specific outcome. And so when we're talking about, you know, a goal or an outcome, you want it to be smart, right? And you probably have heard this before, but a smart goal is something that's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So this is super important. And however you want to go about doing this, 
For example, I've used things like Trello, which is an app that you can use on your phone or on the computer as a web app. And it's a way to organize a bunch of lists. You can keep it very simple. You can use a pen and paper. I mean, to be honest, that's how I started out, right? I mean, I would be journaling and I just might write some goals down. And then you could use something like the fire planner. The book that I wrote is literally a planner because I know that people have trouble sometimes creating these plans. And the planner gives you on the left side or on the right side, whatever, how it's laid out is there's information that you can learn first. And then there's a part for you to write into there to really bring your ideas together and start creating some outcomes and things that you want to do and accomplish. So however you want to go about doing this, it's just important that you do it. And the funny thing is that like I've done plans before that I've just totally forgot about. And I write it down on a piece of paper and then I might find it like maybe like five years later. And I'm always amazed that I've accomplished it or gone above and beyond it. And at the time, I had no clue how I was going to do that. I was just like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to write it down here. So I really encourage you to take some time tonight, even if it's a pen and paper, even if it's an email, to write down what your outcomes are for, I would say, let's just say year five from now, five years out, right? Knowing that we're going into a recession, knowing that this is a big opportunity, what do you want? Do you want 10 rental homes? Do you want your stock portfolio to be magnified? Do you want a thriving business? Whatever it is that you want, throw on there. And don't worry about how you're going to go about doing it yet. Just worry about the outcome. And what is that outcome going to mean to you? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to your family? And how is it going to build your confidence over time and give you that freedom? You know, my mission is to help you guys to get money as a tool to use to live your best life. And I think a lot of times, once money's taken out of the equation and you can pursue completely freely your best life, you know, it's about creating impact for other people. All right. If you guys do need any specific help, just FYI, I do financial coaching. There's a link on there if you want to find out more. If you want to do a free 20 minute call, there's also a link to my Calendly. If you want to listen to a podcast that talks about building a millionaire mindset from the inside out, I've got a podcast that I do with my partner, Marlon Smith at Breakthrough Millionaire. If you want to learn about NFTs and crypto, um, you can go to NFTs Unlocked. And if you want to learn more about stock investing and how to invest passively, and really automate this process. The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins is, is an incredible book. And then in terms of real estate investing, I really like the book called The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. So I'm sure you guys have all heard of Keller Williams. So Gary Keller is the, one of the founders of that. If you have any other questions, definitely email me at michael.financiallyalert.com. And if you don't have a copy of my book, you can find it there if that's of interest. And for those of you that do have a copy of my book, if you wouldn't mind going into Amazon and writing it, that would definitely help me out a lot. We are just about to 3,000 copies sold. I think we have about 100 so left to go. So super excited about that. Something that I never thought that I would necessarily even do. But uh, hey, I had it on a plan at one point, on a, on a goal list somewhere, and it kind of just manifested itself.